Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Brookings. I'm uh, Martin Indyk, the uh, Vice President and Director of the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings. Uh, on behalf of uh, the Latin America Initiative at Brookings and our Metropolitan uh, Studies Program, uh, I'm delighted to have the opportunity uh, to introduce a special guest today, uh, Eusebio Leal, uh, the Havana City historian and director of the Old Havana Restoration Project. Um, it's a special uh, pleasure for me to do this because uh, I have uh, only recently come back from a uh, study tour uh, to Cuba, uh, which uh, the Brookings uh, Institution uh, organized for our uh, scholars and uh, members of the Board of Trustees uh, so that we could go and, and learn about and listen to uh, the many voices uh, in Cuba. And uh, we had the opportunity uh, on that visit uh, to do a walking tour of Old Havana and witness the restoration that has taken place there, which stands in stark contrast to uh, the rest of Havana, uh, which is uh, unfortunately falling down. But uh, Old Havana is being uh, restored in a, a beautiful way that does uh, great respect um, to the history uh, of the old city. Uh, and uh, Eusebio Leal, more than uh, any other individual, I think, uh, is responsible uh, for that project and, and the work that has been uh, done there. So uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here today, sir, and to listen to what you have uh, to tell us about uh, that project. Uh, Eusebio Loyal is uh, a, uh, a man of uh, many talents. He, uh, in addition to being a historian and director of the El Havana Restoration Project, he is a public intellectual, a parliamentarian, a member uh, of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Cuba. He is uh, here in the United States to speak at the New York Public Library, at the National Trust for Historic Preservation, um, also at the Council on Foreign Relations, that other organization uh, in New York, um, and the United Nations. Um, for several years, Brookings has uh, uh, been involved in a series of projects, publications, and meetings on Cuba and U.S.-Cuba relations, uh, building on the work, that work we, we undertook that study tour to Cuba, um, because we believe it's important to understand uh, the dynamics of change uh, underway in Cuba and the role that the United States uh, and the wider international community can play uh, in supporting uh, the Cuban people. Uh, we believe that the best way to do that is to engage in direct, respectful, and civil discourse with a wide range of actors uh, in both countries. Uh, and that is very much what we are committed to do uh, in the spirit of a, a free exchange of ideas in the pursuit of knowledge and better policy. Uh, Dr. Leal will speak for uh, some uh, 20 to 30 minutes about the challenges of restoring old Havana, the financing mechanism designed to make it sustainable, and its impact on the process of economic reforms now underway in Cuba. After he's spoken, we're going to have a panel discussion uh, with uh, uh, Richard Feinberg and uh, Robert Puentes, and this is going to be moderated by uh, Ted Piconan, and Ted will introduce uh, the other panelists uh, after Dr. Leal addresses you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Eusebio Leal. Uh, just one other point. Uh, Dr. Leal will be speaking in Spanish. There will be simultaneous translation, so if you need it, you should have your earphones. 
Muchísimas gracias por su Thank you very much for your generous introduction. I am extremely honored and happy to be here uh, and speaking with you. Before I traveled to this city, I had a, a, some, a few presentations in the city of New York, and uh, as a Cuban, I felt uh, welcome in that city. I am happy to be with you, and I remember the times we spent in Havana. That was an important visit because at that time, I met with illustrious citizens from Cuba that are part and parcel of the diaspora of any nation, especially an island nation, that were marked by a history that we are aware of, not exclusively uh, that pertains to Cuba, but also from other countries in the Americas. But however, due to a natural law, the diaspora also brings about uh, a meeting, uh, an encounter of based on values, roots, real facts that are tangible and that come about due to the respectful and constructive dialogue, a need to look into the future. We can't live looking at the past. And the city is the framework where the expectation takes place. Havana is a city that has a, an exclusive name and makes it exclusive. She has a place in our heart and in our memory. It is an accumulation of stories, styles, and circumstances. When uh, an eminent Cuban philosopher Jose Caballero was asked what his philosophy was or his school of thought, he said precisely, all schools of thoughts and none of them. That's where I stand. That's why the city in its urban style and architecture offers the image of a splendid eclectic style that pleases the eyes of the Cuban people and how they view the world. This is how we like our architecture. There are uh, they are seen in our space, in our city, and yes, the city is there covered by a veil of decay, but when we remove the veil, we see the city as uh, splendid. The city does not end in the limits. Uh, beyond ha Old Havana, and the historic center expresses its starting point. I cannot give you a lecture in 25 minutes of each of the images, but as the images unfold in front of you, I'd like to uh, make a few comments. The images that you see at the beginning are drawn by children, and if the lights are dimmed, you can see more clearly the state of decay of some buildings that were thought to be uh, not able to be rescued, but due to archaeological research, uh, we, some of them were saved with a great deal of love and effort. Love builds and hate destroys. We will see a generation of loving people that 
answers to the needs of the people who love its city just like they love Baracoa, Camagüey, or Santiago, or any other city in Cuba. Let's start our journey throughout time. At the same time, I can explain to you what are the basis for the project. When there are no safe bases, utopia becomes a fantasy. We need to know where we are going and what are the resources we have available. So up to 1994, all the restoration projects were financed strictly by the state, the municipalities, and the search of international funding at a time when the resources were running low because uh, the donors had other needs. And my staff realized that we had to develop our own economic base. And that would happen as the doors of Cuba would open and when People from the outside would come in hundreds and then thousands, and now almost 3 million people have visited Cuba last year. More than 400,000 were um, Cuban. And I think that the, the fact of being Cuban is, uh, plays a large role in the history of reconstruction and our view of our own country. Being a Cuban means we, re we want this job to be done and we're working towards it. And St. Paul said that, as St. Paul said, what is first for Cubans, this is what we have at heart. 400,000 Cubans that become one or three or four multiplied because when they come to Cuba, because they come with friends and relatives and they become an economic force uh, and because they come and go and they keep doing it. We, when we define that the money that the tourists are bringing can stay there, how can we administer those funds? How can we get a tax to be used for restoration, a 2% of every um, activity? that is a tax not only on individuals, but also on public companies. These are new opportunities and the possibility of citizens to contribute to the restoration as they open buildings and or get loans to fix their own homes, and that creates a capacity to restore without relying on the state or grants from international donors. However, we cannot renounce the or welcome funds from Belgium or Spain or Sweden or the municipalities that Jose Martí defined as the salt of liberty. And precisely from those municipalities from Europe, we have received support to create the project for human development locally. Uh, this is a UNDP program, an engine for many initiatives. Starting in 1994 and with a loan of $1 million, our project, our vision of all the possibilities, we 
started getting, uh, we bought a new hotel, a hotel that had historic significance, and a group of dilapidated businesses that would become the network of a business center. Last year, that million became 120 million uh, dollars. When last year, we stopped asking money from the banks because we, the banks were demanding to, uh, their requirements were too demanding. We believed that not having access to the international banks, we had to free ourselves from banking loans, bank loans. We took stock of our situation and we came up with a new strategy. Creating waves and different centers within the historic center and unfold our activity. I must say that I need an assistant. I can't do both things. We created centers from a hotel. We increased up to 17 hotels, and then a commercial center. And you can still see the uh, walls. The, and starting from many areas in the center, we developed our activity. This is uh, a city with fortresses, a business center, a great deal of initiative that we just had to unleash. Last year, we were able to multiply the 1 million into 125 million and with a, a, a good balance that allowed us to invest in two directions, social investment and community investment. Social and community development, the attention to priority needs uh, of the community, such as restoration of hospitals, creation of school networks for uh, training young people in the arts and education. Now, due to new laws, they can have urban cooperatives with their own capital to face the restoration work. This is what the historic buildings look like, and these same objectives become polished just like a diamond would, and the areas were cleaned. We had pedestrian streets with new signals, a new uh, lifestyle because man thinks as it lives and lives as it thinks. That's a duality. And Freelancing has a new position in the Cuban economy. People have a certain degree of autonomy, and we can apply that strength to unfold multiple activities. The old square is now the vital center of the city, and you see uh, the Palacio Cueto that is being restored. Let's look at the palaces individually. This is the history of Havana, the names of the founders of the city. And let's see how 
they are transformed, applying sometimes solutions that have to be weighed out. We are looking at the building of the planetarium, that in addition to the 42 palaces, museums, old churches, and new um, buildings that worth, were worth nothing, and now people have, are receiving offers of $120,000 for their apartments, and now people are now able to sell their homes and to uh, bequeath them. This is the old university that was destroyed and now it's a historic document. You see the rooms of the college where the team is restoring the building. Based on this economic independence, not relying on the state budget, we can build new temples such as the Russian Orthodox Church, the Greek, the Jewish temples, um, African and Masonic lodges and to areas where artisans can come in and work or to bring up to speed the new, the old locomotives and they come into the city to be restored and to be um, brought to its splendor. The financing tells us that if we look at the Palace of St. Isabel, the way it was before and the way it looks right now, this is where the Cardinal and the Pope came, Jimmy Carter was there, this is the Hotel of the Smokers, or the Frail um, Brothers. This is now becoming also a development bank, the Hotel Saratoga, the capital that is being restored, or the Palace of the Marques Felipe de Santiago, and this last hotel that we just finished. Hotel Terral at the Havana Malecon, Oceanfront, where we establish a new dialogue with the commercial network where we are meeting new needs of cafes, bars. This is part of the tourist agency that has entrusted us with this work. Now, in, let's look at the Church of Belén and a school, a, a, the convent, a community center where the seniors are welcome or those of in need, where we have a philanthropic support of friends of all over the world and some funds uh, contributed by us because without social development and social justice, there is no social equity. Here we have a residence for seniors just uh, recently finished in the historic palace and our factory uh, for wheelchairs uh, for the uh, handicapped of uh, Cuba, uh, children of Cuba, libraries, and the new home for the children, for the uh, sisters of God. You can see also historic palaces that have become new dwellings because it's the triumph of the city that is inhabited and not decertified. It's the triumph of beauty that is so necessary to human beings, so as necessary as bread. And lastly, at the historic center, there are examples for the rescue that we would like for the rest of the city. Let's look at the houses at the 
um, Quinta de Molinos, the monument to Martí, the uh, School of Law, the library, the new Napoleonic Museum, where the two collections are housed, Julio Lobo Lavarrias and the Palace of Oreste Ferrara and Merin, or the house of the green tiles in the Fifth Avenue. Let's look at the ruins of the house and its re revival as a center for modern architecture. The cemetery of Havana, where all the monuments have been restored, including those of the presidents of the Republic, the, tumba, the tomb of Emilia Tebo, the portico, the president, tombs, Jose Gomez, Alfredo Sayas, Mario Menocal, and the works of architect Porro, modern works uh, that have been restored. And the coastal area of Havana, the tunnel for the bay, the new beer factory in one of the uh, port areas and a view of the, dis the wharfs that were not being used that now have been restored and the new station the way it will look in November of this year. And let's look at something else. All these wharfs are such as the one in Puerto Madero, Buenos Aires, have been restored. Teatro Martí, this is of great interest to the economy. Pharmacy uh, Sarra, Sloppy Joe's, the Congress, the Capitol, the interior of the Capitol, and the intense cultural life that gives way to the economic life that must flourish, uh, museum, conferences, concerts, lecture halls, the religious life, and new development opportunities that are of a non-state nature. Uh, individuals, businesses, and other opportunities that are shown in this image. Let's look at the restaurants and the um, boarding uh, opportunities, all individual businesses. These are the new businesses that people are putting together. Look at the houses that are for rent in the historic center. It's hard to compete with the originality of the families, the artist studios. That's how things are. And now I turn to you. Please, you can ask me any question. Um, that you may have. This is not an easy path. There are difficulties along the way, but this is a good time. The, there's a great deal of cooperation, intercultural dialogue, interreligious dialogue, public and private uh, partnership dialogue as well. And that's what I think it's important. Muchas gracias, Dr. Leal. Thank you very much, Dr. Leal, for your presentation and to give us a very quick overview of some of the work going on in, in Old Havana. Uh, we wanted to take advantage of uh, Dr. Leal's visit to open a, a, a wider conversation about how the, this renovation is happening, uh, what lessons might be learned for other cities that have uh, such rich cultural heritage and to understand a little bit better how it fits into the Cuban economic system and the economic reforms <coughs> that are currently underway. And to help us do that, we have two commentators uh, affiliated with Brookings. And we're first going to turn to Dr. Richard Feinberg, 
who is a professor of international political economy at the graduate school at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, Richard is also a non-resident senior fellow in our Latin America initiative here at Brookings and uh, someone who has contributed a great deal in a short amount of time to our work on Cuba. He accompanied us on our study tour and also published a monograph, which I highly recommend to you, um, called Reaching Out, Cuba's New Economy and the International Response. Uh, Richard is well known to many of us here in Washington uh, from the time when, well, he goes way back to stints at the Treasury Department, at the State Department, and as Senior Director for Inter-American Affairs at the National Security Council during the Clinton administration. Um, we'll then turn to uh, Robert Puentes. Uh, Rob is a Senior Fellow here at Brookings with our Metropolitan Policy Program, and he directs the program's Metropolitan Infrastructure Initiative, which uh, was established to address the transportation and infrastructure challenges facing cities and suburbs in the United States and abroad. Uh, Rob focuses in particular on issues of metropolitan growth, transportation, urban planning, uh, and smart cities. He came to Brookings uh, after some time directing infrastructure programs at the Intelligent Transportation Society of North America. He's also an advisor uh, at the community level uh, in Northern Virginia, which is one of the most complex areas of transportation and suburban planning, I think, in the country. Uh, so well informed on that, has written a lot on these issues and their bios are in your packets. Um, we'll then, uh, after their comments, uh, hear more from Dr. Leal, and then we'll engage in uh, some questions. Richard. Uh, thanks very much, Ted. Uh, it is a great honor to be here on the podium with Dr. Leal, uh, who is uh, certainly one of the most distinguished and most widely respected uh, senior personalities uh, in Cuba. So I'm very pleased to be with you. Uh, he also has a spectacular project, the, the renovation of Havana Vieja, uh, really one of the world's great enterprises. Uh, Havana Vieja, it dwarfs the other uh, colonial uh, enclaves uh, in the hemisphere, much larger than Panama, Puerto Rico, or Cartagena, which were all linked by the Spanish back in those days. Uh, so it's really a, a, a huge and important uh, project. We saw some of the master plans here. I've seen them uh, in, in greater detail. Clean up the entire harbor, uh, modernize all the docks. Uh, fashion uh, an inviting embarcadero to produce a living, productive city uh, is the goal. Uh, the plans are there. Some progress has been made. But I have to say it's not entirely clear to me exactly how the project is going to go from here to there, how they're going to realize in some reasonable period of time these extremely ambitious goals. Uh, I'm just back from Cartagena, where the uh, Summit of the Americas was held. I was also in Cartagena in the 1980s, when it was also a very decayed enclave. In 30 years, just 30 years, it has been completely transformed. Uh, Cartagena now just has not just international hotels, it has lots of playful boutique hotels, dining al fresco, lots of inviting retail shops, just in 30 years. In Havana, uh, the Malecon has had scaffolding up for decades. Uh, if you've been to Shanghai, the Chinese in one year renovated their entire waterfront uh, to prepare for the uh, World's Fair in 2010. So uh, the question really is how to advance this project more rapidly to prepare for the huge rush of tourists that is likely to occur. Uh, Dr. Leal said now about a little short of 3 million. One can easily imagine 5 million or more tourists uh, during the course of this decade. So the challenge really uh, is how to renovate more rapidly Havana Vieja, as well as the entire city. And Havana Centro, the old commercial center, is actually more decayed today than it was uh, probably 20 years ago. So how to match aspirations uh, and financial capacity. So I'm just going to, if you will, Dr. Lay, I'll throw out a few uh, sort of uh, musings or questions as to how one might get from here to there with some speed. For example, uh, will uh, Cuba allow international hotels to make equity investments? Uh, there are some, but most of the joint ventures are really actually management contracts. 
Uh, I was told when I was there recently that uh, one of the international uh, hotel chains offered a large equity injection, uh, but was told no. The, that would remain in the hands of, of uh, Cuban enter government enterprises. Uh, will Cuba allow private citizens not just to rent in Havana Vieja, but to actually buy properties there? So that then, with ownership, uh, they could fully renovate them, put in boutique hotels, uh, restaurants, uh, uh, commercial outlets, whatever they, whatever they wished as private owners. And will banks offer mortgages to such private investors? Will the large construction projects, and Dr. Leal did address this, uh, be encouraged to hire uh, the self-employed workers? And to hire self-employed workers as part of the new economic reform process uh, that themselves are hiring workers, that is to say are creating actually small and medium-sized enterprises, as a conscious policy to spur forward uh, the economic reforms. In other words, to what extent can the reconstruction of Havana Vieja align with the economic reform process underway? Uh, already underway in, uh, in Cuba. Uh, is Cuba willing to revamp the rules that govern the establishment of the performing arts? Currently today, uh, there are a lot of tight restrictions. If you have a, a little theater or whatever, very tight restrictions on entrance fees, all sorts of rules regarding, regarding hiring of, uh, of the performers, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, Havana Vieja should be a mecca uh, and a showcase for Cuba's fantastic uh, performing arts. Dancers, musicians, actors really should be visible everywhere. Uh, but in order to allow that to happen, that requires a considerable revamping in the regulations that govern uh, uh, private activity uh, in the arts. As retail shops are established on the ground floors of these uh, larger buildings, uh, will preference be given to local design to local manufacture, or will Havana become just another outlet for the global brands? If you go to like uh, the Goom department store in Moscow, recently renovated also, it's just the Gucci shops are there. Not really very interesting. And that would be a shame. Uh, if some of you may have seen the, the Venezuelan Cuban production, Havana, uh, Havana Eva. Havana Eva is the story, it's an inspiring journey of a female worker in an apparel factory who overcomes bureaucratic inertia and opens her own design, designer dress business. Very inspiring. Will Havana Vieja become a destination for a generation of uh, Havana Evas? That would be so exciting. Will Cuba really open up to international cooperation? My study that Ted referred to uh, reaching out uh, shows that international cooperation can succeed in the Cuban context. But quite frankly, the Cuban government has allowed some international cooperation in, but very com controlled and very small scale. Will Cuba really open up to international cooperation so that it can take some good pilot projects and really scale them up? And then finally, of course, Dr. Leal is very concerned about uh, research and historical studies. Uh, but will we be able to see really robust financing? Uh, for the University of Havana, I was there recently. Yes, it's being remodeled, but it has a long way to go. Uh, we really need a huge injection of money so that, among other things, we can do good joint historical studies. Uh, and I'm hoping that Dr. Leal's trip here will help establish some joint international cooperation projects to improve uh, the research and studies uh, um, in Havana Vieja. So uh, there has been some wonderful progress, but I think the question is how to accelerate it uh, how to finance it, how to best integrate uh, the Havana Vieja reconstruction with a new economic model, uh, with the new reform guidelines, and how to engage private initiative, uh, both uh, national and international, uh, in the construction of old Havana. Uh, just very finally, um, as historians, uh, we should always find ways uh, to constantly remind each generation about the contradictions of history. We should present history realistically, without varnish, and without denying the beauty and creativity of our inheritance. As we look at Havana Vieja, we should remember what were the origins of this wealth. The origins of this wealth were in the liquidation of the great empires, the great Aztec empires, uh, the Inca empire, in which the, the Spanish galleons took the gold and silver and moved it through the ports of the Caribbean on their way to Iberia. And the wealth also came, of course, 
from the slave trade, the Atlantic slave trade, and the sugar trade. Uh, those we should, so we should keep in mind also that the history of 19th and 20th century Cuba is essentially a history of the rebellion against the very Spanish authorities that are celebrated in the architecture of old Havana. So we can enjoy the architecture, its beauty, its creativity, but without forgetting the ideology that it is embedded within the bricks and mortar of Havana Vieja. And that seems to me, Dr. Leal, is a very fitting task for historians. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you. Well, we'll have a set of uh, excellent questions for you to address, but let's first hear from Rob Fuentes. Rob. Thanks, Ted. Um, uh, well, he's going to come. <laughs> debo, debo hacer un ciclo de conferencia para responder a cada una de las cosas que él... <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. Let's hear what Rob has to say. I don't speak the language, but I didn't get the joke. <laughs> um, but, uh, but again, thank you very much for having me, and thank you, Dr. Leal, for the for the presentation and for the, the beautiful images, really um, very striking. And I think it's really important to look at the, the, the physical piece of this um, because obviously that's the, the tangible piece. I think that we all, um, uh, we, we care about cities, we care about places. It's really helpful to see that for, um, for context. Unlike my colleagues though, I'm not, a, I'm not a Cuban expert. You can trace my last name through Cuba, um, but that doesn't make me <laughs> much of an expert. But at the Metro program, we're happy to, to, to help uh, sponsor this event and to work because of all that we're doing on cities, um, both here in the US and increasingly um, much more globally, um, uh, uh, pr particularly reflecting on the physical transformation that we saw this happening in Havana and we know is happening um, in US cities, US metros, um, you know, and, and worldwide. But I want to reflect for a bit on the, on the economic piece of this because I think that's really where I think most of the lessons uh, can be learned not just for, again, for what's going on across the globe, but for U.S. cities um, and metros who are wrestling with very similar challenges. Obviously, it's, it's, it's a very different situation um, in many respects, but I think there are some good lessons that we can learn. Um, and a lot of this is connected to our work around cities um, and metros that are willing to explore kind of new approaches to, to economic development, um, which is moving away from what we call the traditional one-size-fits-all kind of uh, approaches that many cities and, and metro areas in the U.S. have taken, um, mostly driven by an emphasis on, on consumption and amenities, what we call this kind of Starbucks and Stadia approach um, to economic development, that if we just focus on these amenities, then all these good things kind of will happen. But we know that there's much more um, systemic problems and systemic challenges in, in many, many places. Um, so part of that, in many cases, is this emphasis on more of the productive elements um, of the economy, things like manufacturing, things like logistics and exports uh, to take advantage of rising global demand, um, but really focusing on the market advantages and the distinct and unique characteristic of individual places. So again, not a, not a cookie cutter approach, but really focusing on what's unique and special about these places. And we heard very clearly one of the uh, many things that are, that are uh, unique and special about Havana is, uh, is the physical piece of this, and the buildings and the architecture of the urban form. Um, my caution, though, is focusing on, on tourism is a little tricky, um, and particularly as it relates to U.S. metros, um, uh, because it's, hu it's obviously a huge part of this amenity-driven um, economy, um, and challenging because of the potential for volatility, and really what we would call um, at the metro program, and as it relates to U.S. metros, um, kind of middling quality jobs that, that result from the tourism trades, these sector, these uh, service sector jobs that may not be kind of the high-end jobs many folks um, are looking for. But again, I know that Havana is obviously and definitely very, very idiosyncratic. Um, again, tourism is a big piece of this for all the reasons I think that we know. Architecture, culture, the physical layout of the city, the urban form, all those things that make the city very special. It's obviously, and it's a Caribbean island, it's obviously a nice place to be. It's not, I'm not gonna mention it, it's not Buffalo, for example. So tourism obviously has a lot of potential. I should make fun of Buffalo. but. Tourism has obviously a lot of potential in a place like Havana for, all, for those reasons, but obviously I think the big challenge is to figure out how to make sure that the needs of the tourism sector then redound down to the larger um, advantages of, of the city and of the, uh, of the country. So how those economic benefits result in a better Havana from an economic, a social, and a particularly an environmental perspective, again, given that it's an island. So 
using tourism then maybe as a first step to rebuilding um, uh, the economy, a, a stronger economy. So strategically, I think, using, using tourism. So, so how to do that? I think one thing that, that came to mind as I was listening um, for a place like Havana is, is a reflection of this hottest wave of city building that's happening all across the world and is around this issue of smart cities, which may seem incongruous given the focus on historic preservation and, 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 the, uh, and the tremendous architecture that exists. But I think uh, even though the term is a little amorphous, which is basically the convergence of technology when it comes to um, cities and city building, but, um, and some of that is directly related to the consumer for things like smartphones and how the consumer experiences cities, which may or may not be challenging in a place like, um, like Cuba, I'm not really sure. But as a centralized government, I think there really is um, advantages that would come from the deployment of this technology and in stark contrast to what's happening here in the US, which is very diffuse and we're missing a lot of uh, challenges to link up these various um, technological deployments. So things like intelligent transportation systems, um, smart grid technology, renewable energy, um, smart water management, emergency management, which I know is something that the Cubans do very well, but we can really take much more advantage of those things if they're all linked up. With, they're all obviously very related to one another. It's hard to do in a place like the US. I think it might be easy to do, or easier anyway, I'll be Pollyannish, in a place like Cuba and Havana where it is much more centralized um, and much more top down. So um, we know this is happening in a lot of tourism heavy places, places like Barcelona uh, and Copenhagen and, uh, and Tokyo, places that are really on the vanguard of these, um, of these technological deployments as it relates to the, to the tourism sector too. So I could see some potential there um, and hopefully connecting that to the economic reforms so that maybe local entrepreneurs can also take advantage of, uh, of, of these technological deployments, help diversify the economy and move away from the heavy reliance Again, just on tourism, which I think may be a good first step, but it's maybe challenging you know, for the long term. So other things I'd just like to hear about, again, the, the, the pieces around infrastructure. Again, I think that the city was able to benefit from not having some of the infrastructure that we built over the last bunch of decades in a lot of places, highways that have cut through old historic districts and have kind of really ruined a bunch of cities. I think there's some advantages there, but still like to hear more about how you know, how we move people around and how people in Havana kind of uh, interact with the city. The financial model, I think, is very interesting in how money is being raised and then put back into the historic district. So it's kind of a, a revolving, I think actually made this kind of gesture, a revolving kind of approach. Um, we know that a lot of places in the U.S. do raise taxes on, uh, on, on tourists and take advantage of hotel taxes, things like that. Sometimes they were down to the larger benefit of the city, sometimes not. I'd love to hear more about that. And then, especially as it relates, I think, to the, to the demographics um, of, of, the, of the country. It's, again, it's a little bit unique. I think it's kind of upside down demographically, like it is in, maybe in Japan and some other parts of Western Europe. Um, and so how all that plays out when it comes to things like housing, when it comes to things like workers who are going to be employed um, to take advantage of these service sector jobs um, around the tourism industry. So again, thank you very much. I've learned a lot. I think we're going to learn much more. And I appreciate the time. Thanks, uh... Well, we've put in front of you a lot of questions. So, um, you know, I hope you can answer some of them in the short amount of time. It's very difficult to answer your questions. I am an intellectual. I'm not a businessman. I am a person with a view, a vision of the time that I, um, my times, and I have been asked to work towards a certain goal. And with my team, we have worked a great deal. And we have to understand that this is a, a trip to the US where the last revolution was held in 1976. I come from a country that has had a intense political life in the last few decades, and I am here because Cuba is still there. If Cuba wasn't there, I wouldn't be here. It is important to state that many of the questions that have been asked de una situación de absoluta normalidad en el flujo de relaciones entre Cuba y Estados Unidos. Should be 
dealt with within the flow of relations between Cuba and the U.S. I am here working in the direction that I think is suitable. Our respect, within our respect for our own sovereignty, uh, we, we are thinking that, say, for instance, yesterday I was at the Metropolitan Museum in, the, in New York, seeing how they restore paper, and I went to a room where they have the stockpile of restoration materials. I have to look for the same material in Japan, Spain, and Germany. And I asked her, and she said, well, I, I buy all of this in Broadway. For me, it is impossible to do that because there is a, a trade law that is being applied uh, with Cuba since 19... 1914, and it is applied to only one country, Cuba. Cuba is the safest place for tourism for the for Americans, U.S., and because you'll never see anybody being kidnapped by force or see criminal gangs killing people, you will not see American flags being burned there. And when there is a, if there is a U.S. team coming to Cuba to compete, the Cuban audience will stand up when they play the national, the U.S. national anthem. Uh, for us, the important thing is not what we need, but what we have. What do we have? We have Cubans from Cuba that are a few of us are in Cuba, and a lot of them are in the U.S. Some of them arrived with nothing uh, as foreigners and now are great personalities. One in 10 Cubans are college graduates. They, you will not find one single Cuban child sleeping under a bridge. That is precious. And based on that, we are building a development project that if we work on it gradually, because otherwise we run the risk of having the Cuban society collapse, we have to work gradually, step by step, in the right direction. And what is the right direction? First of all, the country needs many things, just as I need restoration materials. I need, for instance, yesterday afternoon, I bought a toothbrush, a marvelous thing to buy a, 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 a good toothbrush. I remember someone said, when the world triumphs, nobody should touch Paris. Paris should remain as it is. Oh, as we always say, we always want to have a last capitalistic country to go there and buy a good pair of shoes. And undoubtedly, we need to do things gradually. To, we, we are willing to change, to work for change, and the new generation has, is, needs and wishes to have access, and they no longer can interpret the old, the, the, the new codes of their society with the old codes of their parents. That we have to accept about tourism and relying on tourism, we can't do that. As you said, it is volatile. And that may uh, cause this opportunity to collapse. I think that it is important to seek out other avenues as to the distribution of spaces in agreement with the, in regard with the agreement with the U.S. We are looking, seeking oil that we know is there right now. Cuba is producing 
con una inversión muy grande, porque and nuestro it, petróleo es pesado, with a pero se minimum el acompañamiento de gas, investment, que es muy we will have also gas that is important for the future mar, of Cuba. Mar, right now, Uh, getting petroleum from the sea could be a first step. I would not want to be completely reliant on oil, but that would be an energy solution. We would have to make a huge investment está en la normalización. Yo creo que en la normalización de las relaciones económicas in y investment. políticas entre Cuba y los Estados Unidos. Para mí eso es fundamental. I think that normalizing US Cuban relations creo is an essential point that would be a magnificent moment and I would have many questions to ask. Cuyo juicio me reservo y no a Cuba. Why can't, why can you go to North Korea and not to Cuba? Why China and not Cuba? Why Vietnam and not Cuba? So that not has to be erased. We have to change things so that the Americans have a constitutional right to travel to Cuba. And it would be nice to offer them the hospitality that we are in a position to offer. And that, that is a noble goal for the future. It is a miracle when we celebrated the 400th anniversary of the Virgin of the Charity, or that the first holy saint, Pérez Varela, lived and died in the U.S. The church was asking, there is something missing. What is missing? We are missing a miracle for him to be saint. I think that the miracle of Padre, Father Varela is Cuba, because his last words were, I, Entonces, si eso es así, I offer yo soy my suffering soy to celebrate Cuba. I am a no Christian, ahora, and I say it with pride. Tanto, I always have. And I think that de este juego, un there is an important element is that rationally we are not using the, uh, the pro providence and this is a country where we where the dollar bill say in God we trust and I want I want peace and Cuba is has endured what nobody else has para su destino Cuba ha resistido mucho tiempo. Cuba ha resistido uh, the carta. challenges that could Nosotros have affected its destiny. And you have said that historians have to no look beyond Nosotros or inside the impact on the bri de bricks. De España, We are sons of Gallego, and daughters of Vasco, Andaluces, Galician, Asturiano, Basque, Asturian Cuba, immigrants that came to Cuba to build the country. And we fought our own parents to, for the price of freedom. And even Clara Barton went there to Cuba to mitigate the pain of those who have fought. And we fought with respect, but we don't turn our back on Spain. She gave us, she gave us our names. We are sons of Spain. As Borges said, and we, it would be foolish to think that Cuba, está llena de matices. Cuba is monolithic and there are no nuances. The familia, nuances can be seen gente. in our families, Tenemos in our people. Diversas. We have diverse opinions. We are unrelenting critics of ourselves, and that is a reality. 
que eso será la fuerza salvadora. Hay preguntas que no puedo responder, porque no sé. Sería un acto de vanidad de mi parte decirle que yo sé cómo va a ir esto. Le diría algo también, con toda franqueza y honestidad, porque no puedo Because I cannot lie, I can tell you that many think like I do, and some don't. Some want peace, others want transformation. Some want to hold Cuba tight, to tighten it to the limit. And others want the world to open up to Cuba and that the U.S. opens itself to Cuba. Perhaps the fate will be that in some years no after Cuba will become not just in the best friend, become the best friend, but no also the best ally of causes that we can Nosotros defend. No the Cold War has to end. We cannot be the last bastions of the Cold War. That is an undeserving punishment. I really believe that. That's how I believe. Um, as to Mr. Puente, uh, uh, as a historian, you are not Cuban, but your name means bridge. Puente means bridge. So let's build a bridge, and we'll walk on that bridge. If we don't build that bridge, we'll be lost. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Leal, for that inspired and, and passionate uh, expression. And I think, as you could see in the room, uh, <coughs> this is an issue that captures uh, the attention of, of a lot of us, and of course, not just in this room, but throughout the country. And as you know, there's uh, a, a very uh, vigorous debate about uh, our relations and uh, the way things work in Cuba, don't work in Cuba, and a lot of criticism goes back and forth between both sides. I think the point is to actually have exactly this kind of conversation so that we can start understanding the different points of view, have a dialogue, and uh, see how we might be able to move forward and find common ground. And so I'm, I'm actually very encouraged uh, that you've, you've said this, uh, but I also think it's important to recognize that the change process in Cuba uh, is going to take time. It's underway. There's some encouraging uh, economic reforms underway. Um, and I think one thing in particular that you touched on that I'd like you to comment on is, is the role of the Catholic Church. Uh, you know, not only uh, generally as a, an expression of faith, uh, but also in some practical ways. Uh, in the sense that the Cuban Church, uh, the Catholic Church in Cuba, is beginning to uh, sponsor trainings, uh, teaching, and education in small businesses, in how to uh, learn how to run the kinds of businesses that would be beneficial to the restoration of Old Havana. I'm just wondering if you could comment uh, from your role in uh, uh, connecting pieces in that puzzle. Uh, the role of the Catholic Church and, of course, the visit of the Pope, half a million uh, Cubans and visitors in uh, the Plaza de la Revolución for the Mass. Um, Revolution is a social fever. It happens when, throughout the years, there is an accumulation of justice that forces change. Change has to do with a focal moment where different forces converge. I will not pass judgment about that. I, I'd like to situate myself. Catholic Church is a church of conquest and up to 1898 has remained faithful to the agreement between the Holy See and the Spanish crown. And that created for the Cuban church a great problem because the church had to coexist many years after the independence of the Hispanic peoples between 1810 and 1824 with a colonial system that 
uh, supported two islands, Cuba and Puerto Rico, in the middle of the Mediterranean uh, Caribbean Sea. One side of the church responded intensely to the charity claims and protection uh, by the faith, and that led to thinking that the search for a better Cuba would indicate the need that a, a, an imminent uh, a good priest could become a political figure, Father Varela, precisely because his destiny and work was not understood. He died in the U.S. in St. Augustine in 1853, the same year that José Martí was born. Only 75 years after the abolishment of slavery had gone by, and so the church had to reconstruct itself during that period, the first black priest was ordained in 1947. I met him. And the integration of social and ethnic society was hard, and it still is, because racism does not lie in the law, but in the minds of people, and they bring about these circumstances. The social uh, Cuban society is mestiza. Um, not by blood, but by culture, and the culture is the determining factor of the mestizaje, the mixture that of which we have pride. The church faced enormous difficulty that society collapsed and the church lost its natural support according to its times, the college system, the school system, the property system, the seminary and training of priests, but it was never uh, never received funds from the state. It was always free. It picked its bishops and priests, and it faced the contingencies of a society that, in accordance to the vocation picked by the revolution, manifested itself as atheist or alien to a religious belief. It was very painful and arduous to evolve, and all societies evolve, and the Cuban society did evolve, not towards tolerance that I detest, but to, towards respect. I don't want to be tolerated. I want to be respected. And it was painful. Uh, and, but, however, due to the Hispanic culture that also inherits the fact that ma male prevail over females, and that has been overcome both in science politics and culture, it has been overcome, but after um, lack of understanding that were sometimes harsh and hostility, uh, those that are believers of any denomination are part and parcel of the society. During the Episcopalian conference, Cardinal Jaime Ortega Lamin has played an important role. He is an example, and his life is an example of this. I have witnessed his life as a priest, and I joke around with him. I told him, if I had persevered, I would be the cardinal. But that was not my vocation. For instance, I designed his, um, his badge. I put a phoenix bird that instead of feeding his, uh, its pigeons uh, was hovering over a um, nest of fire. And I put a, a star, a five-point star, 
And I told him this is the star of Cuba that will guide you, and it has. And that I think that it is uh, slanderous to accuse him of everything he has been accused and fairly be when he spoke words such as conciliation, reconciliation, dialogue, uh, forgiveness. For us, those terms are fundamental. I think that the church does not, may not reflect the totality of the spirituality. The slaves embrace the faith, but they have African faiths and they use the, the syncretism of the Cuban society is part and parcel of its being, its poetry and music and its spirituality. For some is the Our Lady of Charity and for others with the same devotion is Ochun. And there's also an evangelical influence that is important. The evangelical community has played an important role. Pentecostals, Adventists, but uh, mostly Presbyterian and Baptist are the historic religions of Protestants and that way into the ethics of faith and they have contributed and continue to contribute uh, in the spiritual life. The Christian communities have a great deal of uh, weight in the Cuban culture. There's a center called Felix Varela, a multicultural academic center that has started a dialogue with the Cuban diaspora, a, a group of intellectuals has visited and we have had a conversation about our life. Thank you. We, we have some time for, for questions and I would ask you to please form them as questions, uh, not as long comments. And um, we only have a little bit of time. Uh, so why don't we start, uh, John, please, and then we'll come over here. There's a microphone. Please identify yourself. Hi, John McAuliffe from the Fund for Reconciliation and Development. First, a wonderful talk and appreciation to the Obama administration for making it possible for you to be here with a visa and wish that that will become more consistent as a policy. I'd be interested in whether in your time in New York and here you are receiving from American foundations or donors expressions of interest to assist in your work in Havana Vieja. And then I'd turn to, to Ted and Richard to ask whether they think there's any chance that OFAC would license such kinds of assistance. Why don't we take a couple, couple more questions um, before we come back. This gentleman here. Uh, Dr. Leal, Philip Hughes from the uh, White House Writers Group. Uh, I had the privilege of being recently in Cuba as well on one of these uh, study tours, uh, and we had a tour of Havana Vieja by your young assistant when your own schedule at the last minute uh, prevented you from escorting us as, as planned. Uh, my question is this. In the photos of the remarkable restoration that you have been achieving in Havana Vieja, and for which you really must be congratulated. It's a World Heritage Site and you're preserving it. Uh, we saw much of the deteriorated yeah. condition, not just of Havana Vieja, but uh, a little glimpses of the wider deterioration in Havana. Some of which is so severe that you might have thought that a war was fought there. But there hasn't been, obviously, war damage in Havana. So I'm wondering if you could share with us your explanation for how this exaggerated deterioration has actually happened. An article of about a dozen years ago in City Journal, famously called uh, Why Havana Had to Die, attributes this to sort of the historiography of the current regime. But you must have a different explanation. Let's take uh, one more question over here on the corner. <clears throat> Uh, 
Uh, uh, I will be asking Can first. Can you please uh, identify yeah, yourself? Uh, uh, Cesar Alarcón. Eh, eh, profesor universitario, eh, doctor. César Alarcón, college professor, eh, doctor honoris causa, electrical engineer in the eh, US. I would like eh, to doctor, ask que el 13 Dr. Leal, we know that October 13, 1960, the laws 890 and 1891 were passed to expropriate foreign industrial companies and banking system most of their owners were Cubans, middle class. They have not returned because of political reasons. They got nothing back and they were forced to migrate. Don't you think that the government is looking for an opening and it would be seen as a good will gesture to return? garantías amparadas en códigos internacionales de comercio y entonces a partir de ahí empezar a buscar inversionistas and then para la seek isla. investment for eh, the we'll island we, that's all we have time for thanks no okay. tenemos más tiempo It would be like asking the French Revolution to return the head of Louis XVI and the Marie Antonieta Es que la verdad, son pocas, son pocas. Sí, sí, con el mayor respeto. Yo le respondo con respeto porque. With all due respect, and I am answering with respect. Es como ignorar que cuando ocurre un acontecimiento cataclísmico, failing to accept that when this cataclysmic events happen, such and it, they happen in France or the Haitian Revolution, the U.S., that they are milestones that mark a beginning and an end. There are people that have lost huge wealth, and I am proud to see them here in attendance and that they have lost a lot of money and that they have had the courage to build in the world and in the U.S. and to go back to Cuba and to to say that they were not back to claim anything, but that they want to see what we can do for the art, because art is, does not recognize countries. But I also want to answer your question. Yes, we are coming from a devastating war. And at some point, people were asking themselves, what will we eat? What will we use for light? Uh, uh, a terrible time during which 18 out of 24 hours, there was no electricity. There were a million bikes, and those who didn't want to ride bikes had to walk to work. That's a reality, and I, we started a trend to reverse all of that. Deprived from the real estate speculation that other countries have seen, based the things have collapsed, and the house with the green tiles, for instance, that you saw was literally collapsing by the tunnel. That was a symbol of the de the dilapidation of the city. And the restoration tried to be a news and encouragement to start restoration everywhere, but it costs money, money and more money besides enthusiasm by my team and those that are saying I would donate 100,000 liters of paint to paint Havana. I am thankful, but it's not about just painting. It's more serious. It's the networks. It's the electrical systems. Havana Vieja no tiene cables, Havana Vieja, uh, old Havana doesn't, it has um, underground wires, and I can't find spare parts anywhere in Mexico. It's exactly the same, and I've told them I want to buy the cartridges 
for the system, but they say it has U.S. components and they are not able to, they would violate uh, the embargo laws. And so we have to put into the infrastructure hundreds of millions of dollars. It is admirable uh, the, the patience and the resilience that Cubans display. We have been fixing elevators in places where there have been seniors. They've been locked for a long time because they were not able to be repaired. Um, so the city is, is uh, in dear need. We now go into the storm season. If, if the, the cyclone hits Havana, what, we may have a state of public emergency. Um, I plan for this the whole year. And what I have brought you, the images, is, it reflects the work of a nation, not just mine. Uh, with a great deal of effort, we have used the proceeds from tourism. And in Camagüey, there are works in progress. Cienfuegos has been restored, uh, beautiful work. Trinidad, the same with these new initiatives, and we cannot demonize them. All economic initiatives are, by nature, irreversible. Uh, there is no time to go back. None of these new economic formulas can be changed. But at the same time, they have to be deepened and move forward. And the future cannot exclude any viable option because now Cuba is free from Spain, the U.S. and the Soviet Union. We are completely free. We are in the world with a suitcase in one hand and a, an old sword in the other. But with dialogue, in the future, I see that with great expectation that Cubans may invest in Cuba, uh, we can rebuild, reform the migration laws, both in the U.S. and in Cuba. And I feel very proud that, as you said, I have been granted a visa that is an act of supreme courtesy to someone that is a, a contemporary <laughs> expression of Don Quixote. I think that's an appropriate yes. way to uh, wrap up our session today. Uh, I do want to emphasize that our discussion here will continue uh, at Brookings. On Monday, we will be hosting an event in which a group of Cuban and, ac and American academics have been meeting for two or three years to talk about a number of issues on the bilateral agenda. And we're going to be presenting some recommendations that came out of that dialogue. That's Monday morning at 9.30 here in this room. Please. Join me in thanking the panelists and Dr. Leal.